Celebrations like this are volatile opportunities to rewrite history and to be self-indulgent in the most ridiculous ways. And we've seen that happen at some of our own meetings. So what I what I what I want what I want to try to do is celebrate 30 years, but not in a state of self-indulgent intoxication, nor in a fit of drunken and Orwellian rewriting of history. So here are the, here are the questions that we've posed for each other and for ourselves. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with A and go through and let you know which question I'm on at the time. In the wake of my activities as a founding member of Science for the People, I was in the early 70s looking for a professional home among Marxist and other radical scholars. I was working on problems in the comparative study of science and specifically on the so-called Needham problem. I was not comfortable with the radical venues for, for a variety of reasons, nor did I think or find academic sociological meetings especially congenial and inviting. It was at this moment in the fall of 1974 that I received a call from the late Nick Mullins, inviting me to join him and a group of others planning to attend the February meeting of the American Sociological Association. Their objective was to form a new professional society dedicated to the sociology of science and technology. The first meeting of the society was in 1976 at Cornell. If my voice starts to drop off, let me know in the back, please. I attended that first meeting and was received warmly, both personally and professionally, by neophytes and elders alike. Derek Price must be turning in his grave at the way I'm dressed today. <laughs> I had found a professional home and was immediately caught up in the machinations of the society's administration through my new relationship with Daryl Truman. I could see that there was something new breaking in the sociology of science horizon where some of my new colleagues had already headed and in some case cases breached. I don't know how well I had articulated aspirations, except that I was extremely curious about how science worked, and especially intrigued by the idea of the hard case. I was soon hot on the trail of hard cases, and this would become a lifelong quest. The Needham problem, the social realities of scientific practice, the relationship or non-relationship between physics and mysticism, Mathematics, mind, brain. Slowly I realized that the transcendental represented the limit of these hard cases and that we had to be able to sociologize God in order to tame the brute fact and the pure sciences. B. I suppose I have to say my aspirations have been fulfilled, both in terms of what I myself have achieved and what my colleagues have achieved collectively. We don't know more in general terms than Dirk Krem and Marx did about the nature of science, but we definitely know more in specific and in-depth terms about the nature of scientific practice. We know the details of how science works in laboratories, in research organizations. We know a great deal about the machinations of science policy, and we know more about how to ground pure science and mathematics in the realities of the mundane world. The disappointments turn around in the first place. What my old friend Steve Woolgar refers to as the institutionalization of the provocationism in early science studies and the routinization of disobedience. In the second place, they turn around the resistance to the very idea of social construction within and outside of 
science studies. Grasping the sociological nature of mathematics, especially pure mathematics, led me to leave the study of mathematics and turn to the study of mind and then brain. Insofar as I, I had articulated aspirations, I can say that I'm very excited by the potential for offering a sociological orientation to gene and brain-centered assumptions, theories, and research on human behavior. The sociology of brain takes, on, takes us right into the center of the hottest areas of scientific research in terms of professional science and in terms of the public arenas of science. In the second place, I've increasingly returned to my sociological foundations, to the fear and uh, there's something. Barry Barnes once said to me after a lecture I gave in Exeter, we went out to dinner, Barry said, why are you so sociological? <laughs> I mean, that's a strange sentence, a sort of question to begin with, and an even stranger one to be coming from Barry, I thought. But anyway, um, the result has been that I've tended to become increasingly paranoiacly sociological, uh, <laughs> and you'll see some of the results in a minute. Finally, can we build on new knowledge the way, is that a microphone? Yes, sir. Excellent. Keep talking. Keep talking. Ready. State of the art. <laughs> we build on new knowledge the way all sciences do, by continuing to inquire, to exercise our curiosity and creativity, and most of all, perhaps, by training and educating the next generations of science studies researchers. I can see new ways of thinking about science, new modes of interdisciplinary research and theory emerging in the work of my graduate students. I have great hopes for exploiting the explanations, the explanatory potential of science and religion studies in ways that impact not only our understanding, but whole cultural patterns. I try focus and I'm still getting used to it. There are limits to all forms of, law, of, of inquiry. And sociology and science studies may go the way of natural philosophy. It will be harder to dissemble, to disassemble and remanufacture social and cultural analytical theories, methods, and perspectives. Let me just say something about the panelists. Uh, all three of us were at the first meeting at Cornell. Um, I met Karen Knorr when she handed me a part of a bitten apple uh, and asked me if I wanted a bite. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that story that, before. That, 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 haven't we heard that story before? Uh, <laughs> so here we all are, 30 years later. Now, what, what, what most of you maybe don't know is that the continuation of 4S was a very close thing for a, a number of years. Every year seemed to be, all right, are we going to make it even through the conference, let alone show up next year? Yep. Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead. I'll adjust it. I'll adjust this. Right. Um, so things were things were pretty close for a number of years. And uh, that first meeting, there were 109 people in attendance. Everything was a plenary session. Um, science policy was really represented, as was science metrics and building metrics. We had the great uh, Professor Zalai from the Hungarian Academy, uh, a, a major presence. He didn't have to say a word, he just had to sort of stand up, and that was a statement by itself. <laughs> the importance of that presence was his representation, both not just of Eastern Europe, but of uh, an, or an orientation to science studies, science policy, science metrics, uh, things that uh, people often forget were a core part of what this society was about at the very beginning. That's all I have to say on, on that right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The title, The Elusive Sociological Imagination, it has to do with my contention that in spite of claims to the contrary, 
Well, I think there are a lot of people still in, thanks, in the uh, first, you didn't give me a mic the first time, I got an Apple phone. Even in the early years of, uh, of Forrest, there was a sense that, oh, we did a few laboratory studies, we now know what the social is, so we can not worry about it too much. My contention is, I think there are a lot of people within this society, within sociology, certainly outside of sociology, who really don't yet quite get what the social is. Here's Steve. Since its beginnings, STS has undergone numerous modifications and re reincarnations. Yet the initial work stands as an early articulation of its ongoing provocative potential. We need to understand the dynamics whereby the disobedience fostered by SDS can flourish and perish and, and persist. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Steve. <laughs> now, you, you have to have known Steve uh, during his Beatles year uh, to know about the different routes uh, Steve might have gone. Um, and to know more about why he is a, a good representation of provocation and disobedience. And I'm going to run through this real quick. Emil Durkheim, Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need to say. I think we're, we're, we're still, we still, most of us, don't understand what Durkheim was about. <laughs> What, do you want to see that again? <laughs> Give me a break. Durkheim solved the problem of relativism. Um, really, if you read, read, read what he had to say about why the social construction of time, space, and scientific knowledge itself doesn't imply relativism. Uh, David, David Bloor, Karen, Karen and I have been arguing for years about why social construction has no implications about relativism. David's contention over and over has been that it's absolutism that we're opposed to. That's really at, at issue here. These are things that Marx may have had some problems understanding it because he was scientistic in some ways. So was Durkheim. But as far as the sociology of science, they, um, I'm not sure we could really have taught them much more than they already knew, except in the details. A little bit now about the hard case. I started out with uh, John Needham's hard problem. And I had a long correspondence with Joe over what he used to call the big problem. And um, that went on for many years. And that was my initial direction. I was going to, going to, uh, going to uh, study in Chinese science, the history of Chinese science. Uh, Joe invited me to uh, Cambridge to work with him. I tried to take a year off to study Chinese. That didn't work. And that was the end of that, that possible trek. <laughs> then, uh, Nathan Sivett, for those of you who know, Nathan Sivett told me I could learn Chinese enough to actually work with Needham in one year. Eight hours a day, seven days a week, one year, and I'd be able to work with Joe. I, have, I got tried to get a fellowship to do this without success. All right, so then uh, I got involved in the early laboratory studies, um, some ethnographies of engineering, then my arguments against Fritzschaff Capra, sociology of mathematics, social robotics. I want to get to where this is all taking me. Um, going from, what I, I finally figured out that mathematics doesn't come from inside the heads of mathematicians. So my question became, well, if it's not coming from the heads of mathematicians, why do they have heads? <laughs> that led me to the to think about the sociology of mind, but then the real big move to make here is to go to the sociology of brain. And there's Einstein's brain. Here's a Japanese mathematician who was shown Einstein's brain when it was being sort of traveling about. When I meet Albert Einstein's brain, I meet Einstein. <laughs> you would think it would be easy to disabuse people of that notion. It turns out not to be. Uh, Leslie Brothers, Friday's Footprint, the idea that you could study mind and brain sociologically didn't come into print in a serious way thanks to the hands of a sociologist, but rather through the hands of 
a psychiatrist, and neuroscientist. I happen to be friends with Harold Garfinkel. Maybe that has something to do with it. That's an interesting idea, by the way. Friends with Harold Garfinkel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you understand. <laughs> um, here's a, how does that show? Here's, I, I've, I've developed this uh, your brain protocol. I do do empirical research. And this is a drawing that a child did, 10 year old boy. First, we asked him to draw a brain. And he drew this and the little lines of it. Then we said, draw a mind. And he wrote in the words, stop, 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 stop. This is just one example from uh, an ongoing study. I'm also doing an ethnography of magic at the Magic Castle, sociology of brain. And then we get to the sociology of God. Um, God is a, you know, I'm really way out of time here. So, yeah, I've got a few more minutes. Um, I, wrote, I just wrote a paper with a friend of mine about the math wars. And at the end of the math wars, I put in a section, uh, something like manifesto against the minor renum. Um, an argument against pure reason. And I used the line of Renouf because in her latest book on Geidel, Rebecca Goldstein uses that, that word, those words, to describe a, a view of logic as independent of social cultural factors. I put this at the end of this math wars paper. Sort of, we need to do a sociology of God to get rid of the Platonic and transcendental influences that create the grounds for arguing in favor of brute facts and pure math and pure science. Now, the, the editor of this book that I'm doing this for, it's a sort of radical activist type, he went berserk. You can't say this. You can't, you can't write about sociologizing God. So I had to sort of figure out a way to tame that gave it to my younger colleague, I said, you tame it because I can't. If we, don't, if we don't have a sociology of God, if we don't have a sociology of religion, we're really not going to get very far with a sociology of science. And you know, oh, by the way, social construction is not a philosophical idea. It's not a critical political tool. And it's not anything like what French uber thinkers claim it is. It's the fundamental theorem, the general sociological theory, and the central dogma of the sociological imagination. Now here's where I tie my old friend Steve, the provocationist and disobedient child, to uh, my original, I guess you could call it training and indoctrination, into uh, the more radical aspects of the field, which, by the way, again, were really quite present in those early years of forests. I don't know how much I want to, how much credit I want to give to, to this statement anymore. This was written by Horowitz uh, many years ago, and he probably didn't, didn't mean by this anarchism in the way that I might want to mean it. Um, but keep in mind that Kropotkin wrote that anarchism is one of the sociological sciences, and he called for the application of the methods of the natural sciences to the study of human institutions, by implication, scientific institutions. Does this sound familiar? You read David Moore. Okay. I think, I'm not going to show it. I just wanted to get that off the screen. I got to be careful. I can't move certain directions here. This has been an amazing 30 years, and I think we really, we really need to settle down and see what it is we've achieved in these 30 years. Um, he's going to tell going to talk about science words. I have a, the title that I gave to the notes I was reading from earlier was the 30 years science words. Because we've been at battle with each other and with people outside of this field for the whole time we've been in business. I'm sort of tempted to say, get used to it. Um, but let's, let's get serious that we've really done something here. We've really revolutionized our understanding of what science is. 
what it means to do science. And I think I, I don't have any cute ending here. I think we're going to stop there and turn it over to Eric. short and sweet, um, very, very different to cells. Um, I was going to talk about, uh, I did in fact spend some time preparing uh, an edited version of uh, an event which was big in Britain in 1994, which was a meeting of the British Association for the Advancement of Science. Um, but I learned after I prepared the edited videotape, which I thought people might find was interesting, that there'd be no video uh, facilities here. So instead, uh, those are four of my photographs from this videotape. I didn't know this videotape existed until about a few months ago. Uh, and then I found out that it did. And it's really quite fascinating to go back and listen to it. But the, in 1994, Brian Wynn gave the first presentation um, the late John Zyman gave the second presentation. Brian Wynn talked about Chernobyl and the sheep farmers. John Zyman talked about, uh, it was a sort of very complicated schematic business about how science develops. Lewis Wolper, who's the, uh, the villain of the piece in the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, accused us all of being absolutely dreadful people. It was, it was a real big science warrior uh, attack by Lewis Wolper. And yours truly um, tried to make the case for science studies. It was the second two talks, Walpert's and mine, that, that captured the public imagination and, and we were full front page of the Times Higher Educational Supplement uh, that uh, week. Uh, and even made the, uh, the Daily Telegraph, as I recall, the Peter Simple column, for anybody who ever sees that, where I was referred to as a busy little man. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, it was an interesting experience, and I, it probably had some sort of effect on, on the way I thought the whole, whole business. Uh, I, but um, let me just tell you some of the things that were said. Um, Walpert said, why, why have this group of really very intelligent people, he used to actually have his glasses up on the top of his head like this, why have this really very intelligent group, intelligent group of people been consistently hostile to science? In all the readings of sociology of science I've read, there's virtually nothing but negativity. And then various other stuff. I'll come back to one other thing he said later. And then I got up afterwards and, and uh, accused him about this. Um, I called him a liar. Um, and that caused quite a bit of fuss. Um, but um, I was quite surprised when I listened to this tape about six months ago to discover what I'd said. And... Um, so instead of the tape, we've got a transcript. So this is what I was saying. This was just after the Golem had been published. One of the things we're doing, I said, is to make the whole world safer for science, trying to protect it against those who might react against it because they see the failures of some of the overweening promises that have been made. We're saying, start to see science as expertise. Remember, it's 1994. Start to see science as expertise. That way, you can respect it in spite of its occasional flops, of which there are about to be some. We're saying, just because the scientists didn't get it right about the fallout from Chernobyl, that does not mean you should react against science. We're saying, love it for what it is. A body of the best expertise that you can get, there isn't anything better. That was 1994. Malcolm Ashmore and uh, um, Brian Winner in the audience applauding these sentences. Um, and I was surprised because I couldn't remember that I was on this expertise trip or 
so far, well before, of course, we were on the expert teach bit, because it says similar things in the Golem, actually, if you read it carefully. So I have to say, we are bringing my co-author, who's sitting in the front there, into the business as well. Anyway, let's go back to, the, to what uh, Sal asked us what to do. He's already put these things up. What, your, what are your aspirations? How have these aspirations been fulfilled? And how have the result run? Um, blah, blah, blah. So aspirations. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do you want to? <laughs> how is a result? Actually, because he's done it already, so I thought we'd do it again. How is a result of the unfolding of events or understanding have your aspirations changed? What are today's aspirations, especially in respect of how we are to build on our new knowledge? And um, these were my aspirations. I started in this business actually in uh, 1971. So these aspirations I built between 1971 and uh, uh, 19, so the mid-1970s. Um, there was quite a lot going on, actually, in the UK before the famous 1976 meeting of Forest. Um, we'd had other, various other meetings and the whole strong program and the things that were going on in Bath were going on. So my aspirations, anyway, were to replace the philosophy of science with the sociology of scientific knowledge. That's what I decided we needed to do. We put all this philosophy of science talking about how experiments uh, touched it, how theories dealt with you know, hard experimental data, and I thought it we should replace that with sociology. The other ambition I had was to develop a new kind of empirical <coughs> sociology. I was at the University of Essex at the time, and um, all the clever guys were getting their distinctions in their master's degrees by writing essays along the lines of what was Lucien Goldman's influence on the thinking of Louis Althusser. And I didn't want to write about things like that. Um, and uh, I didn't particularly want to spend any time in libraries either, which is what you had to do if let's do that. So I thought I wanted to get out, get out the fresh air a bit and drive around. And, talk, and I decided I would talk to scientists. But the great thing was this, that we, I thought we discovered after a little while, that uh, if, if Comte is right and sociology is the queen of the sciences, the sociology of knowledge is the queen of sociology. Okay? And we discovered that you could do this thing, the sociology of knowledge, even the sociology of scientific knowledge, by studying what happens in laboratories. By studying, so we found an empirical location to deal with the most enormous questions. And the beauty of the new sociology of science, as I saw it anyway, was that you could still talk about these huge questions that, that the normative Marxists were talking about and so forth. But you could talk about huge questions by doing very small scale case study empirical work. And this, I just felt so refreshed as a sociologist <coughs> by this possibility. You know, at this time in sociology, there was, there was, as I said, it was basically normative Marxism. Almost everybody in this campus had to be a card carrying Marxist, otherwise you wouldn't shit. And, and the way that worked, and this, there's an interesting thing about how the academic world works, is that. People justified this by their rebelliousness. These people were Marxists and they were rebels. They were against the dominant society. But of course, they were getting all the great jobs in universities. And it wasn't very long before they were members of parliament, people working in the city. David Treisman is my favorite one. Does anybody remember David Treisman? He was a real red. He's now Lord Treisman. <laughs> and uh, then a lot of them became evolutionists. Uh, not evolutionists, sorry. I mean, uh, uh, environmentalists. When, when everything <laughs> swung <laughs> into that. <laughs> so there's kind of, there's a, there's a sort of rebels that you get in academic life. The body of rebels. But boy, do they know which side their bread is buttered on. Um, so anyway, once to get away from that as well. So this was the new kind of empirical sociology. And uh, the other thing, of course, was to complete the sociology of knowledge, to, to apply the sociology of knowledge of science. So that was the aspirations. What about fulfillment? Well, obviously, to complete the sociology of knowledge, we've, we've done that extraordinarily well. And to replace, or at least enhance, philosophy with sociology. Now, you know, being older, I now talk to say enhance rather than replace. Um, I don't want to lose every friend I've got in the world. Um, so to, we've certainly enhanced, I think, philosophy with sociology. So that was tremendously successful earlier on, and I hope, to some extent, it's still going on. Uh, and, you know, uh, this is my, I've got um, addicted to these stick men. 
Um, so we, just to put this in stickmen language, we started off with the canonical version of science where people did experiments and people did theories and then all this filtered down uh, until somebody shouted and some scientists shouted out P and then that's the general public and they all believe P. Okay, that's the canonical part of science. And we replaced it with people weren't only doing experiments and theories, they were also saying <laughs> They still filtered, came down to a P, you know, but then at least one person down here could say not P because it opened the world up to saying that. And of course there was feedback between the two sides down there. <laughs> very interesting. So we've done good by replacing that first model this one. <laughs> what about uh, developing a new kind of sociology? Well, again, as I said, that was very, very exciting in the first little while, but now I think we're now reverting to type. And I don't see, you know, it seems to me we're getting too fond of brand theories and big, sort of, big issues, instead of doing this beautiful thing, which is looking for big questions that can be dealt with by small case studies. What about changing aspirations? Okay. Well, here's something where now we get to where I'm, I think I'm really getting out of line with, with a lot of my um, colleagues because um, it seems to me we've had such a tremendous success in leveling down the epistemological terrain as we, as we spoke about it in the Golem that it's left us with a new problem but we no longer know what, is, what there is that's special about science. And this is a hard problem which uh, I've been arguing for myself and another group have been arguing for, well, we don't really know how to handle What is there left special about science, having done all this levelling down? So that's the change aspiration for me. We talked about the flip-flop in the original Golem. Well, I think we've dealt with the flip, now we've got to start dealing with the flop. And I think what we've got to avoid becoming doing today is to avoid becoming just another typical field of social science with its grand theories and its frozen methods and its predictable critiques of power. Uh, it's sort of sound, or, you know, one, one can go, one can always predict what's going to be said now at a meeting, you know, there's, there's one group of sciences that nobody, we, we all don't like, and we bring all our critical apparatus to bear on, <coughs> to show how uncertain the findings are, there's another group of sciences that we take just as a matter of course as being correct, all the sciences to, to do with sort of, you know, being warm. Um, and one of the things that stuck in my mind from Walpert's talk was this. This is another one of the things he said in 1994. He said, we're wildly excited. He was talking about his own field, which is developmental embryology. We're wildly excited. New results are coming out every day. We're really making tremendous progress, and I don't feel that's necessarily the case in the sociology of science. Where's the really new stuff? And I always remember that. I suppose that's one of the reasons I've always been trying to do some new stuff all the time. <laughs> And um, this is the new stuff we're doing now, uh, not terribly popular, but we're doing it. Uh, that, uh, on the left-hand side, my stick men show that, in fact, the original two diagrams I've showed have gone a bit further, and now the top and the bottom have kind of merged. But it's hard to see what the difference is between the scientists and the general public, because uh, we've, we've been so good at critiquing science, and uh, we're trying to... to uh, modify this picture slightly by thinking, talking about experts who lie in between the two groups. It's cut a long story short, the Chernobyl uh, sheep farmers, the, sorry, the Cumbrian sheep farmers post Chernobyl, weren't lay experts, they were just experts without qualifications, and that's the kind of argument, as you know, we've been trying to make. So what about us? Where do we go? Uh, who are we? Are we people who can actually take part in this deliberative process of whether the truth, the scientific truth, is P or not P? Well, we do yeah. seem what? Well, yeah, we do. We seem to make contributions to that now and again. Uh, my favourite example is Simon Cole, actually, who's doing it with fingerprinting investigations. Um, we had a, little, I had a little go at it with artificial intelligence, but there's a nice epistemological question of how we actually. You know, how do we, how do we do this stuff? How do we make, as non-scientists, non-specialists, I should say, make our contribution to whether things are feel or not feel? So I think we should be discussing that. Are we a social movement? I hope not. Come on, to say that. 
Are we people who have, are experts on expertise? I believe that's one of the things we should say we are without any shame. And then what about our own methodology? Is, it, is there something in this that says what our own methodology to do? It must be. Is our own methodology ethnography, as it's appeared to be implicitly presented as at last year's presidential plenary? Uh, is it always interpretative? Yeah. Or could we do experiments? Or should we be doing science? Are we scientists? Should we be doing science? Can we be doing science? Given our critiques of science, can we be doing science? If not, why not? What have we got to replace it? I mean, we're terrifically good at critiquing science. We're fantastic at it. But what do we got? What do we do when we want to find something out? Do we do something other than science? I mean, okay, there was, it was, this was easy in the 1970s or the 1960s when if people used to say, when people would say, is sociology a science? You'd just say, no, of course it isn't. And there'd be lots of clear contrasts between what sociologists did and what scientists did. But then, of course, we were dealing with the old-fashioned model of science. Since then, the model of science has changed. It's softened. It's started to look much more like a good old soft social science. So maybe we are. We've become scientists in that the, our notion of science is drawn towards us. Okay? But then if we're scientists, then shouldn't we be trying to do science by the best possible way? Because I don't think we've ever said that natural scientists shouldn't do the best kind of science they can, in spite of their critique, our critiques of it. So I think there's interesting paradoxes, interesting things to talk about here. And I hope we'll carry on talking about them. So I think what we've got to do today is to avoid becoming a social movement, defending the environment or whatever causes in fashion, and forgetting out that our subject is the study of knowledge, not the defense of any particular substantive pieces of knowledge. I think we've got to avoid ducking the hard job of being creative academics, and avoid taking the easy option of becoming political commentators, because it's much, much easier. It's actually very hard being an academic. But, I mean, I was, I was shocked at, at the 4S plenary session, oh, I don't know, it must be about four or five years ago, when uh, we were talking about Hugh Gustafson's uh, letter to the newspapers about the Iraq war. And in the hall, there was a huge upwelling of applause for him. And I thought, wait a minute, am I, am I in an academic meeting? Where am I? And I personally don't want this society to become a kind of social movement which knows where its heart is with such certainty. I think it should be an academic movement, and therefore it, it should have a lot of doubts about where its heart is. And I think we should be continuing to try and understand what is special about science and what is, and trying to understand our relationship to it. I don't think those debates are over. In a sense, just because of our success in critiquing science and softening its boundaries, we've got a new kind of question about what our relationship to science is. So I think we should be opening our doors to developing new methods, thinking about things in new ways, and uh, possibly becoming a little bit surprised about what sort of discipline we're turning ourselves into. That's it. Thank you. Our chair is not here, and I haven't been, I didn't click that so well carefully enough, so we haven't been doing proper introductions, and why should there be proper introductions? We were there at the beginning, we were all been presidents of the society, we're here now, here's Karen. I'm quite nowhere to put myself, I do not make PowerPoints for once I have avoided having them. Usually I have them. But it was supposed to be a fireside chat, so um, Here we go. So, <laughs> so I didn't do uh, I didn't do a paper or PowerPoints. I um, want to continue a little bit where Harry left off and also answer Sal's questions, which he said I must answer in order to participate. Uh, in fact, I never felt so close to Harry before, <laughs> both physically and when he said uh, how much this field refreshed him and excited him. Uh, uh, I think the same happened to me. Um, but um, 
uh, there, is, uh, there is a big difference also. Uh, I didn't come to this field with great aspirations. And when Sal asked the question, what aspirations did you have? Uh, the sad answer was, in the beginning, I really didn't have many aspirations. I had mainly frustrations with what, um, uh, what the sort of science studies that existed before was allowing me to do. Uh, I didn't like it. I did a big quantitative study uh, 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 organized by UNESCO of scientists and organizations. Uh, we had lots of correlations to deal with, and I even went so far as to learn how to do list level models and spend whole nights uh, and days at the big, at the time we didn't even have a big enough computer at the Institute for Advanced Study in Vienna where I was. So you had to go to a computer center to handle the data and to handle the um, uh, Liswell models, and nothing came out of these models. The models didn't, they, they worked, but you could manipulate the correlations by changing some of the inputs. It was very frustrating to me because I had a very scientific world <laughs> view. I wanted something objective to come out of that. And I learned through doing these models and the quantitative studies that it was actually all up to me how I inputted things or uh, bracketed things or put in new variables. And even then, the correlations would be something, uh, explain something like 9% of the variance, which was uh, no natural scientist, and I uh, uh, still am actually uh, married to one, would even touch that. You know, unless 50% of the correlation was of, the, of the variance was explained, they wouldn't even touch that. So it was very frustrating to me to work uh, relatively hard for a relatively long time <laughs> with this data and do the study and gather the data uh, and to come up with no result. And besides that, I had a lot of traumatic experiences in the field work itself. I did some interviews myself in the beginning to test the questionnaire we used. Uh, and I encountered uh, uh, unbelievable responses. It was like Lady Strauss in the field being traumatized. That you you would uh, uh, you know use the same questions on different strata in the hierarchy of an organization, and they will give you very different responses. All saying, "What do you want to do with that question? I don't understand the question. You have to, you have to frame the question to me." All playing it back to me and not giving me an appropriate answer. So these were some of the frustrations with which I came, uh, with, which, with which I left my own culture, Austria, and went to Berkeley. I shouldn't say Austria, I should say Vienna. I went to Berkeley. Uh, and then I came to Berkeley in 1976, early 1976. Uh, I didn't really have a very focused plan as to what I wanted to do. It was not the case that I had something up my sleeves, and it was just a question of actualizing it. Uh, rather, what happened in Berkeley is that somehow the questions imploded upon me and, and, and uh, provided an opening up of a completely new perspective. And then a few years later, uh, a few weeks, uh, months later, actually two or three months later, the meeting in Cornell happened. Uh, and that um, Cornell meeting in 1976 was a very important date for me because not only uh, did my own beginning of a new study in a completely new way coincide with that meeting, but also the meeting then provided for a number of us, uh, Sal was there, Bruno Latour was there, Ivan Meharry was there, everyone was there, <laughs> provided a new platform and a form of organizing and above all the form of co a forum for communication that from then on allowed us to uh, talk to each other uh, and uh, also fight each other, of course, contest each other's opinions. But it was that platform and that forum provided by, for the first time, by the Cornell meeting that changed things for me. Um, um, I came to the field as sort of an emperor without Close. I was closed in all these philosophy of science beliefs about science, uh, but when it came to understanding scientific practice, I had no conceptual tools. Uh, they were not there. They were simply not there. And I think many of us developed them uh, by working through their 
first field studies and how to develop them. Uh, Edinburgh studies and your studies, Harry, I'm sad to say I hadn't read at the time, even if they existed before, I, I wasn't really aware of them because there was no organized field. Maybe that is the reason for it. Kuhn, I couldn't do much because it was mainly historical in my mind and I didn't know how to, uh, how to really get a lot out of that for uh, in uh, the sort of observation and ethnographic study. I embarked on, and why did I embark on that? Feyerabend had much to do with it, Aaron Sikruel had a lot to do with it. Aaron Sikruel, as some of you will remember, wrote a book against survey research, method and me measurement in sociology, and had been at the Vienna Institute where, where I was. Feyerabend had been there, and with shiny eyes talked about the content of science and how exciting it was, I don't know, 2,000 years ago. So it was impressive to just listen to him. Uh, and Sikruel gave us sort of the theoretical background for rejecting a methodology that I had experienced to be very problematic. I just couldn't get anything out of it, even if I wanted to, and I tried relatively hard. Uh, there was uh, another factor there, and I do want to mention it, and that was uh, uh, what uh, perhaps the new geographer geographers would call the causalities of a place. Berkeley, for me personally, was quite important. Uh, it, was, it, was a, um, um, it was a very, uh, I would say, post-social environment even then, uh, in the sense that, of course, there was interaction, but somehow the decision-making was pushed back to you. You had to make the decisions. They didn't it was not a collective process. It wasn't interactional in the way it should have been, in my opinion. Now, those of you from the West Coast will, of course, immediately uh, correct me and say that was a wrong impression, but I came from Vienna, and Vienna had a strong notion of social relations and society. And then I came from the 60s, 68 generation movement, and those were counter communities created against the Viennese society, but they were also very strong uh, relational movements, uh, communitarian almost uh, in many ways, with communitarian decisions. And you got to Berkeley, you, you had the feeling that people could be married to a horse and nobody would notice it. <laughs> and, and this is something I felt at the time. Uh, or, uh, you know, someone would offer you a cigarette and you would say, okay, I'll take one if you take one. And he would stare at you and say, you take one if you want one. If you don't want one, you don't take one. You know, in Vienna, uh, smoking a cigarette had always been an interactional social accomplishment. <laughs> in Berkeley, it had to be an individual accomplishment. And I think that was quite important for me because it uh, cut me off from some of these uh, um, uh, social circles and social concerns and created an opening for uh, engaging with something else and engaging on your own with something else. Of course, this is a post hoc rationalization of what happened at the time, but I don't think if I had stayed in Vienna and would have done the sort of laboratory study I embarked on there. Now, in... Um, 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 in regard to your next question, how were your aspirations fulfilled or, disappointment or, or disappointed and what do you know now that you didn't know then? Um, uh, when I read the question, I thought, what do you mean? Of course, everything I know now, uh, 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 I owe to uh, what happened between then and now. Uh, and I think it's quite uh, important, perhaps, because it, it sheds light on the phenomenon that uh, the new sociology of science, or SSK, or STS, or whatever you want to call it, is a generational discipline. It sort of came about with a whole generation being at the beginning of their careers. I said I knew nothing about science. Uh, Harry, of course, always knew more than uh, uh, anyone else. <laughs> but, and Sal may have known more, but at the same time, it, it had the feeling of uh, a new generation at the beginning of a career turning that 
that discovery of what could be done in science studies into a career and keeping at it around each other and around the questions that were generated in the process. What are this field which we have now, you know, would it necessarily have happened? I don't think so. I, I think if there hadn't been, uh, you know, a group of people uh, being forced together to some degree by the Cornell meeting, and then re, uh, you know, uh, re, uh, <laughs> reorganized every and refreshed every year by another meeting and by many hospita hospitalities and generosities of people like Sal, who organized meetings at his home, for example, or Don Campbell, who, even though he wasn't part of the group, <coughs> helped organize meetings and did uh, uh, promote the cause without actually ever publishing himself anything in that new area. So without that sort of generosity, it wouldn't have come to anything. And of course, without the um, <laughs> uh, generational aspect, people that were young in their professional career uh, needing to do something and find something that would be important for them, uh, if all of us had been older and at the end of our career, probably the field wouldn't have happened as, as it did. Um, so 1976 was uh, very important, and the field of science studies is one of the great aspirations that has been uh, fulfilled as a consequence of uh, this meeting. Uh, but you also asked me, have you learned something uh, that you didn't know before? Uh, and I don't it's impossible to, um, um, uh, of course, uh, open this completely up and say, at least all the things one has learned. Uh, Harry said that before. But I want to put my finger on one thing I've learned that was a little disconcerting for me. Uh, and I believe that I've learned that institutions in science, in all sciences, matter more uh, than I ever wanted to believe and that I like uh, that, I like that they do. They matter more. I, I happen to believe now that, you know, the, for example, our humanities ways of doing things have very little to do with the human. And they have a lot to do with how the uh, institutions in the area of the humanities are set up. I, I have seen how that is the case in some of the natural sciences. And it is obvious to me that it's also the case in the social sci sciences. Uh, it is not possible for me any longer to blame all the difficulties we have in the social sciences simply on the field of society and to say, uh, well, it's the human person or it's the way uh, society works that is so difficult and we cannot, we cannot really do much about that. I think we do a lot of things about which we could do something and we don't and it's institutions that are uh, set up uh, in a historical way or to, to, you know, traditions that emerge, institutional traditions that emerge and are not, not uh, very well thought through. And this leads me to the last point, what are today's aspirations, especially in respect to how we are to build on our new knowledge. Uh, this is of course complete fantasy since nobody has any control of anything that happens in this field. <laughs> there, there is no one, there is no institutional stronghold, unlike, for example, the origin of the field of economics, where there were institutional strongholds that imposed certain doctrines for the better or for worse on the discipline of economics. That's not the case in our, in our case. Um, but I do have an institutional, aspirational proposal to make, uh, and that is that science studies after 30 years become should become its own discipline, uh, even if it perhaps should be construed as a sort of a new discipline. Uh, I think that is the logical next stage. It leads away from the social movement aspects Harry criticizes, and I agree with him there. It, it leads away from uh, remaining cultural critics and outsiders. I'm not sure why one cannot work on innovative new topics and be disobedient within a discipline. Uh, science studies, uh, in my opinion, is not particularly strong today. Well, let's say it's not as strong as it could be. And one reason for why it isn't strong is because it happens in 
funnily called committees and programs and, 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 and it is done by individual scholars in other disciplines like uh, sociology or history or philosophy. Uh, and I think what it should do uh, is uh, come together uh, and become much stronger on an institutional level. Uh, however, I would like to see it not necessarily uh, set up uh, as a department, but rather as in terms of centers that is the way of the future for a number of the, uh, uh, not only biological, but a number of natural science disciplines. And if we can do that, we should try to do that too. Uh, I think we are, we have at our doorsteps some of the most sophisticated, uh, intelligence-based, highly trained and specialized, or let's just say some of the most deep and intricate rather than just large and flat or small and picturesque cultures. Uh, supposedly these cultures, the scientific cultures, are also based on learning, which most cultures, in my opinion, and admittedly that's a bit anecdotal and again, many of you won't like it, are not. They are not based on learning. I think many cultures don't learn much. And this is also <laughs> one of the sad things I believe I have um, um, uh, I have learned over time. Uh, these scientific cultures are based on learning. They are linked in the public and philosophical eye together already. Uh, they are not something we have to link together. They are all being science or professional expertise or whatever you want to call them. Uh, we are a little bit in the same situation, I think, as anthropology once was when it had all societies that were not its own at its doorsteps uh, and before things became too complex uh, uh, in, in many of these uh, cases of native societies. But we have a much more specialized and delimited field and are not in danger of having to confront the whole world uh, societies or the whole world uh, as anthropology uh, has to now. We have, I think, a cleverly designed for us domain at our doorsteps most highly sophisticated, allegedly on top of modernity in the modern world, and the driving force of the future, so we hear all the time. And at the same time, it's a domain that is bounded enough that it can be studied by a clever field. Knowledge about knowledge and knowledge making will be in demand in the coming decades. Moreover, knowledge about learning cultures will be in demand, since, as I said before, most cultures have problems of change and problems of learning. Finally, the sciences themselves need reflexivity, and we need the sciences' reflexivity. We should actively apply what we learn from observing science in creating our own institutions, and not meekly following what our social science mother fields are doing wrong. I do not think, however, that we should set up uh, a new discipline, I indicated that before, necessarily in terms of traditional departmental structures. Uh, I see these departmental structures as linked to beliefs of modernity, and some of these, not all, have been undermined for quite some time without the departments changing, even, even at universities like the University of Chicago. We need a much more flexible environment uh, and we also need more in, a more interdisciplinary environment. We need one into which new disciplines can integrate, and we need one into which new methods can integrate. Again, I agree with Harry, uh, we should not be wedded to ethnography. We should emphasize this because it's an excellent theoretical method, but um, uh, it is not uh, necessary to exclude other methods uh, 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 when they prove interesting and relevant. Uh, we should have a somewhat unorthodox setup, but at the same time an institutionally strong setup. And that's why I said perhaps the notion of a center would be one that could carry us forward and that would be on a par with the centers created in fields like nanotechnology and so on and so forth. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, the structures that that would imply, I don't want to go into in detail, but I would like to perhaps give you one example. I see no reason why uh, 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 a field like ours should prevent cooperation on the level of dissertations by forcing 
individuals to do their own uh, a separate dissertation and hand it in. Why it should not be possible to allow students to cooperate on dissertations or even to allow uh, 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 an older generations and students to cooperate on something and still uh, uh, be able to get a grade for that. So there are many, many dimensions of the traditional disciplines that are completely